Father in heaven, your plan is not simply to use a few great preachers, but your plan is to use ordinary people. So, Father, as we open your word tonight and study the book of Revelation, help us to understand that you have overcome Satan. The war continues between good and evil, but help us to have faith that the one who overcame the principalities and powers of hell on the cross of Calvary, that one is still working, and he can overcome Satan in our lives, and he can enable us to be victorious, and he will be victorious at the end. Give us the faith to believe in the triumphant, victorious Christ. <coughs> we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From 1985 to 1990, my wife and I lived in St. Albans, England. I was the ministerial secretary of the Trans-European Division, traveled through the 17 countries of our division in Northern Europe and some in, on the European continent. We had three socialist countries in our division in those years, Poland, Hungary, and Yugoslavia. But one of the things we liked to do was to go down to London. London is a, just an amazing city. You've got the Westminster Abbey, the Houses of Parliament, the Winston Churchill's Underground War Rooms. We visited the Underground War Rooms of Winston Churchill on a number of occasions. This is where Churchill planned the strategy to defeat the German Nazi forces. And it was there they also planned how to crack the German Enigma codes. You know, there are 159 quintillion, I don't even know how many zeros that is, 159 quintillion different combinations in the German Enigma codes. But there, up in Blatchley Park, not far from London, there was a secret group of absolute um, mathematical geniuses, and they worked to crack the Nazi code. A man by the name of Alan Turing was in charge of those, the uh, code breakers, and they began to crack the German Enigma codes in one hour. They could tell what the Germans were going to do, they could tell where the German submarines were going to be, it was just an absolute amazing opportunity to break those codes. Now, after a while, after a while, they were breaking the German Enigma codes in real time. What does that mean? It means that the Allied forces could know exactly where the German submarines were going to be so their cargo ships could avoid them, and so the YouTube, the U-boat submarine hunters could find those submarines and attack them. One writer wrote this, uh, a guy by the name of, of uh, Simon Singh wrote a book called The Code Book, and in that book he said that the code breakers were responsible for winning the Second World War, and he said at least they shortened it by two years. You see, if you know the enemy's code and you know what the enemy is going to do, you can prepare. The book of Revelation is a code breaker. In the book of Revelation, we have revealed the future of this world and how to prepare for it. Now, the book of Revelation is really divided into two parts. In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, you have the descriptions of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is the all-powerful creator. In Revelation 1, Jesus is the one who is our loving Savior. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is the one who conquered death and was resurrected from the grave. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is our ascended Lord. He is the Lord of the Sabbath because the book of Revelation that honors the Creator and invites us to worship the Creator that was given on the Lord's day. You remember Revelation 1 verse 10 where it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In Revelation 1, Jesus is the coming King. 
Revelation 1.7 says he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. So Revelation 1 sets out the all-powerful Christ. Then you have the battle over the throne of God. Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches. Then you have a little interviewed, a little interlude in Revelation 4 and 5. Then you come to the seven seals. Then you come to the seven trumpets. All those sequences of seven reveal down through the ages, Satan's attacks on the church, Satan's attacks on God's people, and they reveal the fact that there would be those that overcame. In fact, in every one of the messages of the seven churches, it ends with, he that overcomes, he that overcomes, he that overcomes. What is God saying in those early chapters? He's saying, by the grace of God, his people can be overcomers. But then you come to chapter 12, Chapter 12 is the hinge upon which the entire book of Revelation turns. Because in Revelation 13, you have the story of the mark of the beast. Revelation 14, you have the three angels' messages to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Revelation 15 and 16, you have the introduction of the seven last plagues and the seven last plagues. Revelation 17, you have the woman that rides on the scarlet-colored beast and the union of church and state. Revelation 18, you have the appeal to come out of Babylon and the fall of Babylon. Revelation 19, the coming of Christ. Revelation 20, the millennium. Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and new earth. But the whole book of Revelation turns, the hinge of that is Revelation 12. Now, this evening, we're going to look at Revelation, the 12th chapter. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to take it and turn to Revelation, the 12th chapter. The book of Revelation is a code breaker. It breaks the codes of Satan and enables us to understand the working of the evil one. Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, you have four vignettes. These are four scenes that we see. It's like looking at video scenes. They're four video clips. They start in heaven. The first video clip we see is in heaven. Second video clip we see in Revelation, the second part of the vision is the birth of Christ and Satan's attempt to destroy him. The third part of that vision is that long period of the Middle Ages. The fourth part of that vision is Satan's attack on God's last day people. So we, we look here at Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Isn't that a strange place for war? War broke out in heaven. You know, people ask me as I travel the world, if God is a God of love, why does he allow so much suffering in our world? If God is a God of love, why does he allow such heartache and sorrow and sickness? And why is the world so unfair and so unjust? And Why is there so much war and conflict and strife? They say, look, if God is a God of love, he wouldn't allow that. And if he was all powerful, he would stop that. Why does God let all this go on? Why did God ever allow Satan to exist? Because God treasures the freedom of choice. And if you take away the freedom of choice, you take away the opportunity to love. Because love can never be forced and love can never be coerced. So God gave to all of his creatures the freedom of choice. God didn't want robot beings in which he would control by some cosmic computer in the far celestial space of the universe. But if you give the freedom of choice, you give the opportunity to make the wrong choice. But God would rather reveal his loving character and allow the consequences of sin to go on so the whole universe can see two things. First, how loving God is, and secondly, how bad the devil is. First, how gracious and kind and compassionate God is, and how selfish and hateful the devil is. And God is dealing with the problem of evil in the world in a way that will secure the universe for trillions of years in the future for infinite eternity. So it says, Revelation 12, verse 7, and the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, but they did not prevail, nor was there any place found for them in heaven. So the great dragon, who's that great dragon? He's the devil. 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. He is the dragon because he destroys. He is the serpent because he deceives. He deceives those whom he will destroy and destroys those whom he will deceive. But notice it says this. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels. But they did not prevail. Thank God they did not prevail. Jesus is our our mighty, all-powerful Savior. He cast Satan out of heaven, and he will cast Satan out of your life. The devil will not prevail. Now notice, it says Michael. Who is this Michael anyway? Now, in the Bible, the term Michael is used five times. And I want to look at every instance in the Bible where Michael is used. Because understanding who Michael is is critical in the final conflict between good and evil that's approaching. We find the first Michael mentioned in Revelation 12, verse 7. It says there, war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought. Whoever Michael is in heaven, he is the commander and chief of all the angels, and he has the power to cast Satan out of heaven. So he must be all-powerful. The second mention of Michael is found in Jude, right before the book of Revelation, the little tiny book of Jude. It only has one chapter. And we look there at Jude verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So whoever Michael is, He has the power to raise Moses from the dead because here Michael argues with Satan over the body of Moses and resurrects them. So Michael must be very powerful. Now some people are confused because it says Michael the archangel and they interpret that as Jesus must be, this must not be Jesus, but it must be an an angel because if you say that Michael is the archangel, and you say Michael is Jesus, that must mean Jesus is an angel. Not so at all. The word archangel here is the commander and chief of the angels. Now, we get an understanding of who Jesus is uh, and why he's called the archangel in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Jesus is eternal. He is not an angel. He never had a beginning and will never have an ending. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what Scripture says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and onward. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So who's descending from heaven, everybody? The Lord himself, Jesus Christ. He comes with a shout. With the voice of what? An archangel. With the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we'll ever be with the Lord. So Jesus comes with the voice of the archangel. What does that mean? Well, you look at the book of Matthew. Jesus comes with all his angels. One of the functions of Jesus is he's the commander and chief of all the angels. So our eternal Lord Jesus Christ, who never had a beginning, never had an ending. He is the commander in chief of all the angels, and one of his titles is Michael. Now, every time you read Michael in the Bible, he is always in conflict with Satan. He is the mighty one who can defeat Satan. We read about Michael three times in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel the 10th chapter. Michael is a special war term that is used to describe Jesus in conflict with Satan, and Jesus never, ever loses a battle. I want you to think with me of some of the different titles in the Bible that Jesus has. In the Bible, Jesus is the lion. Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is the lily of the valley. He perfumes our life. Jesus is the rose of Sharon. He is the one who makes our lives beautiful. Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. 
Jesus is the rock of ages. We can place our spiritual feet on him and we'll never sink in the sinking sands of this world. Jesus is the light of the world. He illuminates our darkness. Jesus is the bread of life. He satisfies our inner hunger and our inner longings. Jesus is the water of life. He satisfies our, our thirst and our inner desire for meaning and purpose. Why so many titles of Jesus in the Bible? Because Jesus is everything to us. Why use Michael? Because he's a mighty warrior. He's our triumphant Lord. He's our King of Kings who never has lost a battle, Daniel, the 10th chapter. Israel is in captivity to now meet a Persia. Babylon has faded away. Daniel prays, but as you look here, as Daniel is praying, he's praying that Cyrus would sign a decree to let his people go free. And notice as he prays, Daniel 10, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Who is that? That's Satan's withstanding. There's a battle over the mind of Cyrus. But behold, Michael, it says in the King James Version, the chief prince in the margin, says one of the chief princes. Michael, who is the chief prince, he comes to help Gabriel. He beats back the forces of hell over the mind of Cyrus. Cyrus signs the decree so the people of God can go free. Look at Daniel 10, verse 21. But I tell you, fourth mention of Michael, what is noted in the scripture of truth, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Who is, who is Michael? Michael is Jesus Christ. Michael is the Prince of Princes. Michael is our mighty Lord. Michael is the one who's never lost a battle with Satan. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man, Michael, sits down to participate in the judgment. But here in Daniel 12, verse 1, at that time, Michael shall stand up. The judgment is over. Michael, the divine Christ, stands up. Who is he? He's the great prince that stands watch over the sons of your people. There'll be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Look, the same Michael that cast Satan out of heaven, that same Michael is the mighty warrior who war against Satan in your life. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Somebody ought to say amen. Why? Because this same Michael will stand up at the end of time. And this same Michael will deliver God's people at end time. We need not fear. We have a mighty, mighty, mighty warrior. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. This first vignette, this first war in heaven. Satan wins. Satan loses. Jesus wins in this battle and in this war. Now notice what it says. War broke out in heaven. Michael, the mighty one, his angels, verse 7, Revelation 12, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Now notice, every angel had to make a decision. One third of the angels were deceived by Satan. There was no neutrality. The Bible says in verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil of Satan who deceives the whole world. His angels were cast out with him. Were some of the angels deceived? Were some of them deceived? Were some of them cast out of heaven? Could any angel say, you know, I'm not quite sure of this. I don't know if I want to be on Jesus' side or I want to be on the, on the devil's side. What, was there any neutrality in heaven? Did every angel have to make a decision? Are we living in end time where there can be no more neutrality? Where every human being in these closing hours of verse history will make some final irrevocable decision for or against Christ. You know, some time ago I read the story of a college student who really needed some money, I mean, to pay off his college tuition. I mean, what college student doesn't need a few, a few dollars to pay off his college tuition? And so he began looking on the internet and through the want ads in the newspaper, and he found this amazing job. He was a, a college student in a Christian college, and uh, he was not very large, kind of a skinny college student. He was one of those nerdy guys who studied all the time, but he found the possibility of making a lot of money 
if he went to Canada and worked with the lumberjacks all summer. His friends said, look, those lumberjacks are cursing, swearing, they, they booze it up at night, They're, they drink a lot of alcohol, uh, they uh, are, are immoral. Once they find out you are a Christian, they are going to rip you apart. But he said, I, I need the money. I need the money. He signed up and he got hired, worked with these lumberjacks all summer. When he came back to college, his friend said to him, what, what, what was it like? What, what, what happened this summer? What was it like? He said, I had no problems at all. You had no problems? He said, no, I made a decision when I was going there that they would never, ever, ever find out I was a Christian. In the last days of first history, do your working colleagues know where you stand? Do the people you interface know where you stand? Are you still on the fence? Every angel in heaven had to make a decision. Either they were for Christ or they were against Christ. And the clarion call comes echoing down the centuries for men and women in this generation to be all out, sold out, poured out their lives for Christ. I love that statement. In the fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 1093, Christ shows that there can be no such thing as neutrality in his service. No such thing as what, everybody? Neutrality. The soul must not be satisfied with anything short of entire consecration. Consecration of thought. Who has your thoughts? Consecration of voice. What words do you speak? Consecration of spirit in every organ of mind and body is not enough for the vessel to be empty. It must be filled with the grace of Christ. There is no neutrality in earth's final war. But here is the incredibly good news. Revelation 12 describes Christ's triumph in the galactic battle. Christ's triumph in the great controversy. Christ's triumph in the Star Wars conflict that waged in heaven millenniums ago. In that battle, Jesus defeated Satan. He was cast out. He did not prevail. In the battles we face in our own personal lives, in the struggles that confront us every day, we have the absolute assurance that in Christ, because of Christ, and through Christ, we are conquerors in the name of Jesus. Amen. Satan's cast out of heaven. Comes to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve fall. But in that garden, Christ has promised that the Messiah would come. Centuries pass. Revelation chapter 12. Here in Revelation, the 12th chapter, the centuries have passed. And the Bible says, Revelation 12, verse 4, his tale, that's when Satan fell out of heaven. There's a transition here. In verse 4, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, threw them to earth. If a third of the angels fell in heaven in a perfect world, does that not lead us to have absolute trust in what Christ can do for us? And an absolute recognition that we cannot face Jesus alone? Is not this a call to prayer? Is it not a call to saturate our minds with the Word of God? Is it not a call to be totally sold out to Christ? The Scripture says, His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, threw them to earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who is this child born of the woman? Who is that? It's Jesus. Verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. When Christ was born, the devil worked on the minds of despotic Roman rulers to pass a decree that every male child under two would be killed. God sent an angel to Joseph, and that angel warned him of the impending 
death of Christ if Herod's decree was passed. And, and God arranged, and God is a strategist. He's amazing. He arranged for three kings to come from the east to give the precious gold and frankincense and myrrh that could be sold to support the Holy Family, Mary and Joseph, as they fled to Egypt and as the African continent opened its arms to receive the Messiah. And there, until the death of Herod, Jesus was supported. But notice what Scripture says. It says that she'd bear a male child, and he would rule all nations with a rod of iron. What's this rod of iron about? A rod in the Bible is a symbol of authority. An iron is a symbol of unbreakable, invincible authority. So Christ would face Satan with unbreakable, invincible authority. He would face every one of Satan's temptations and not yield. He would be tempted in all points like we are and yet not sin. He, Jesus, in his humanity, cried out in faith dependent on the Father, and he was the overcomer. Jesus never was overcame. He was the overcomer. Because he overcame, we indeed can also overcome. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Look at it, please. Revelation 12, verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. Notice, what, is, what has come? Salvation in Christ. Have you received it by faith? What has come? Strength, power in Christ. Have you received it by faith? What has come? It has come. The scripture says there, salvation has come, strength has come, the kingdom of our God has come. In Christ, the kingdom of grace has come. In Christ, we are saved by his righteousness. In Christ, we are declared righteous through Christ's death. The dying Christ declares us righteous through his blood, and the living Christ makes us righteous through his intercession. Have you placed Have you come to Jesus and said, Jesus, I am weak, but you are strong. Jesus, I am sinful, but you are righteous. Jesus, my life is polluted, but your life is righteous. Lord, cloak me with your righteousness. Not long ago, I read a cute little story about about a teacher. I, I praise God for teachers, don't you? This teacher had 37 students in the first grade. Oh, they were squirming students. They could hardly sit still, these students. And after teaching them for about six months, it was about the middle of the year, you know, and the year seemed to be dragging on and dragging on, and this teacher would teach her students all day, and then she'd go home and plan her lesson plans at night. And oh, man, she couldn't wait for those days that were sunny, and like sunny days in in Michigan where the kids could go out and have recess. But it rained for a whole week. And it rained and rained and rained. And the week was coming to the end. And this poor teacher was absolutely exhausted. But these were first graders. And they couldn't get their boots on to go home that day. They couldn't find their raincoats. They couldn't find their rain hats. And this teacher helped every one of the students. And she came to the 36th student. Now she's exhausted. She helps the kid with his rain hat helps the kid with his raincoat. And then she begins working with those boots and couldn't get them on. They didn't fit. And she's exhausted. And she works and works and works and finally gets the boots on. And the kid looks at her and says, Teacher, those boots are not mine. <laughs> and she struggles to get them off. And then with the innocent look, he said, They're my sisters, but she said I could wear them. <laughs> The righteousness of Christ is not mine, but he said I could wear it. Isn't that good news? A simple little story illustrates a divine, profound truth. The righteousness of Christ is not woven with my good works. The blood of Christ was shed for me on Calvary's cross. The nails that were driven through his hands were for me. The crown of thorns that was placed upon his head 
was for me. The blood that flowed from his side was for me. And when Christ died on the cross, he did not die simply the first death that sinners, all sinners, will die if Jesus doesn't come. The Bible says in Galatians 3, verse 13, Cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. He died bearing your sins in mine. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus bore the guilt, the shame, the condemnation. Hebrews 2, verse 8 and 9, to taste death for every human being. When Jesus hung on the cross, he could not see himself coming forth as conqueror out of the tomb. The darkness of that cross was so great. The sin and condemnation of human beings was so great. The guilt was so great that it was the guilt of sin that crushed out his life, not the nails driven through his hands, not the crown of thorns upon his head. He was dying the death for all humanity on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And as he hung there on Calvary's cross, he said, in effect, I would rather go into the tomb and never come out and be lost forever, bearing the guilt and shame of Mark Finley's sin rather than be in heaven and have Mark Finley be lost. When Jesus hung on the cross, the infinite mind of Christ thought of you. And he said, you're worth it. You're worth it. He said, I cannot possibly think of being in heaven without you. There's nothing like this in any religion of the world. Nothing like this in Hinduism. Nothing like this in Islam. Nothing like this in Buddhism. Christianity is unique. Christ leaves heaven. Tabernacles in human flesh. Faces Satan head on. Overcomes in our behalf. Dies the death we should have died. And lives the life we should have lived. Scripture says he is the Lamb of God, dying Calvary's cross for us. I love the way that Charles Wesley puts it. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. If you have come to Christ, the righteousness of Christ covers your sins. And the righteousness of Christ will change your life through Jesus. Because of Jesus, we have the right, the guarantee of eternity. Satan is a defeated foe. The stronghold of Satan has been broken by the death of Christ. By faith, through the blood of Jesus, eternity is ours. Satan is a defeated foe. No matter how contrary it may seem to human experience, Satan's charge against God in heaven was that God was dictatorial, a dictatorial tyrant who did not have the best interests of his creatures in view. The cross reveals a God of infinite love who will do anything to save us. The cross satisfies the claims of a broken law. The lawgiver pays the penalty of our breaking the law. The creator becomes our redeemer. The innocent one accepts our guilt. The sinless one accepts the penalty for our sins and the ransom price is paid to redeem us. Love triumphs over hate. Righteousness defeats unrighteousness. Truth triumphs over error. Life defeats death. Hope is the victor over despair. Lift your head. Lift your head. There's no reason for discouragement. There's no reason for despair. Trials, yes. Disappointments, certainly. Obstacles, definitely. Heartaches, of course. But yet we are the most joyful people in the world because Christ has paid the price for our eternal life and we have a passport for heaven and that makes all the difference in the world. You know, as I travel, to various countries in the world. I need my passport. Now, 
I've had two passports. The reason I have two, two American passports, is because sometimes I travel to countries and you don't want to use that passport if you go to another country. So I traveled through the Middle East and not long ago I was coming out of a country in the Middle East that will remain unnamed. It's predominantly a Muslim country. My wife and I were there ministering. We're coming out of that country and I made a big mistake, big mistake. I had my American passport, but I had forgotten that I had traveled to Israel so many times that I had Israeli stamp on my passport. This Muslim country is at declared war with Israel. And they do not recognize Israel as a nation. Therefore, they, they hold you up in detention if you have an Israeli stamp on your passport. So I'm leaving the country. Tini's next to me, and we give her a passport first. She has no... Israeli stamp in it. So they say, you may go. They look at my passport. Israeli stamp here. Yes, sir. Israeli stamp here. Yes, sir. Takes my passport. Takes it to a little office. Comes back. Israeli stamp here. Yes, sir. Takes it and gives it to the police. Now I'm worried. I say to my wife, get out of here. Go, go, go. Get on the plane as quick as you can. She said, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. I got a loyal wife. I said, look, if they detain me, you got to get on that plane and fly out of here because I need help. you got to get me out. <laughs> you're going to be no good if you're here with me. She said, Mark, we've been married now 57 years. Our wedding anniversary is, you know, next week. So she said, I'm, I, we've been married all these years. I am not leaving you behind. So I said, I better do some quick talking here. So I looked at my passport and I said, um, sir, look at these other stamps on my passport. I mean, I was the guest of the Jordanian government. They flew me there. They flew me to, 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 tape, to tape television programs for Jordan. It's a wonderful country. Then I said, look at these other countries. I travel all through the Middle East, and they graciously receive me. I love the Middle East. You know, you got such strong families and wonderful family culture here. And I just love the Middle Eastern food. And, and you know, I, I... go, sir, go, sir, go, sir. <laughs> You know, so I left as quick as I could. We ran for the plane, you know. <laughs> I came to America. When I came to America, they looked at my passport. And you know what they said? Welcome home, sir. <laughs> Welcome home, sir. You have a passport to heaven. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes again, he's going to say, Welcome home, my children. Why? Because Christ defeated Satan in heaven Thousands of years ago, and the devil's cast out of heaven. Because Jesus defeated Satan in his life. And Satan is a defeated foe through the cross of Calvary. But Satan doesn't give up easily. Revelation chapter 12. Four vignettes, a snapshot of heaven. Jesus wins, Satan loses. A snapshot of the cross. Jesus wins and Satan loses. But time passes. And as time passes, we see another snapshot of Satan. And we find it here in Revelation chapter 12. And you look there at verse 6. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Then the woman. Now in Bible prophecy, who is the woman? The church. Fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. If you're a student of Bible prophecy, you recognize that from 538 to 1798, we have a period called the Middle or the Dark Ages, where church and state united. And in the union of church and state, the people of God were oppressed. And so, Many of God's people fled to northern Italy, southern France, in the mountains, and we had the Waldensians there. I remember not long ago leading a tour. We went up to the Waldensi valleys, and we were in a cave singing the great songs of the faith. How great is our God! And we were singing, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, we're in the cave, very cave where the church-state 
forces lit a fire at the beginning of the cave, smoked out about a hundred Waldenses and slaughtered them right there at that point. But yet, the truth may have flickered, but that truth that was flickered burned brightly in the Reformation. You think, for example, of Huss and Jerome burned at the stake. You think of William Tyndale, who was strangled and then lit a flame. But yet, the truth of God did not go out. As James Russell Lowell says, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and beyond the dim unknown stands God keeping watch above his own. Or as Ellen White says, above the circle of the earth, God sits enthroned and from his great and calm eternity orders what his providence sees best. Look at the text of Scripture. It's an amazing text. Notice what it says in verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place. What did God do when the church was being persecuted? What did he do? A place what? Prepared by God. Now notice, it gets better than that. Verse 14, Revelation 12, verse 14. Notice what Scripture says. But the woman was given to wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time. That's 1260 years, same period. Look, in verse 6 it says God prepared a place for her. But in verse 14 it says the church is nourished When you're nourished, you're strengthened. When you're nourished, you're built up. So in all of Satan's trials, in all of Satan's challenges in your life, God already has a place prepared for you. God knows the trials you'll go through. God knows the difficulties you go through. God knows the challenges you'll go through. And just like he prepared a place in the dark ages, in the darkness of your life, Jesus, the living Christ, who's never lost a battle with Satan, has prepared a place for you. Not only that, Jesus is going to nourish you. You see, trials can either make us bitter or they can make us better. They can either give us scars or they can put stars in our crown. Every trial of life, Jesus is a place prepared for you. Every trial of life, Jesus is going to nourish you. Many of you know that for many years I worked in the former communist countries. First we began working in communist countries. We worked in Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, in the communist countries there, holding evangelistic meetings during the days of communism, during the time of oppressive governments. Then when, when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, in the early 90s we came into Russia, first holding evangelistic meetings in Polhana University, then holding meetings in, in the Kremlin Auditorium. The, you know, the Kremlin is amazing. It, uh, it's where the Communist Party had its meetings for many, many years. And uh, this is where Andropov spoke, and Chernenko spoke, and, uh, and Yeltsin, of course, spoke, and so forth. And then we held meetings in the Olympic Stadium. But during those years, I got to know my dear, dear friend, Pastor Mikhail Kulikov. I, he was the president of our work in the Soviet division. I had the opportunity to travel with him. He left indelible footprints on my soul. And uh, his father was imprisoned. And here's how they got his father in prison in the days of communism. What happened to his father was this. The communist government sent a teenager to request Bible studies from Mikhail Kulkov's father. Mikhail was studying with four or five other young people in the church. He studied the Bible with them. At midnight one night, he baptized them in a river. And this communist young person, young woman, went back to the authorities and said, he, could, he manipulated me, he, 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 he brainwashed me, and uh, I was forced against my will. So he was arrested for county, counter-espionage activity, counter-activities to the government, and uh, for five years he was put in prison. And often when you went into those prison camps, Mikhail Kulov's father, you never came out. In fact, his brother Jacob died in the prison camp. Um, Mikhail's father told him before he was sent off to this prison camp in prison, Mikhail, they're going to come after you next. And they did. Six months later, they arrested him. 
And I asked him, I said, when you were in prison for those five years, what were your feelings? And he said, Pastor Mark, I always felt hungry. I, n I, I always felt hungry. I, I never felt satisfied. He said, I felt cold. I was shivering. You know, it's in Russia. He said, shivering. He said that the, the cells were damp and cold. But then he's got this big, big smile on his face. And he said to me, do you know what? That trial was my postgraduate course. I said, what do you mean? I don't understand. He said, Pastor Mark, I always wanted to learn Hebrew so I could translate the old Russian pseudotal Old Testament, because he, he knew Greek. He said, I want, to, I want to establish a Bible translation institute to translate the old Russian Bible. And he said, I always wanted to learn Hebrew. In prison, I was in prison with many rabbis. And in that prison, with those rabbis, I had plenty of time. <laughs> Although I worked in the labor camps, the rabbis taught me Hebrew in five years. The communist government put me in prison to silence my voice. When I got out, I established a Bible translation institute. And today, the Bible that is used all through Russia, the most popular Bible, is an accurate Bible of the Russian translation from the Hebrew and the Greek by Mikhail Kulikov's translation team because God prepared a place for him in prison and God nourished him in prison. Look, in the trials of life, God's prepared a place for you. The Great Reformation took place in the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. Truth was reestablished there paving the way for the rise of the Advent movement. Because as Paul says in Corinthians, you can do nothing against the truth, but what? For the truth. Four vignettes in Revelation chapter 12. Three of them have already occurred. And the reason God gives us those three to occupy most of the chapter is to give an end-time people confidence that the Christ that cast Satan out of heaven at end time is all-powerful. The Christ that defeated Satan in the time that he lived on the cross is all-loving. And the Christ that protected his church during the Middle Ages is the Christ that is all-powerful of sustaining power. And if Jesus can cast Satan out of heaven, if Jesus can defeat Satan in his life, if Jesus can protect his church in the dark ages, Jesus is going to get his church through at end time. And Jesus is going to get you through. Jesus is going to get you through. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon, who indeed is the dragon, who is that? And the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look, according to Revelation 12, verse 9, the dragon represents Satan. In this passage, Satan's angry with the church. He's angry with the people who keep the commandments of God because Satan wants human beings to worship him and not the living Christ. He wants them to obey him, not the commandments of God. The devil is furious with a people that keep God's commandments. Notice the scripture says the dragon was enraged with the woman, goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. There will be a final conflict in this earth's history. There will be a final battle. There will be a final war. But notice, to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Eventually, the devil will instigate a decree so that human beings cannot buy or sell, be in prison, face torture and death. But Earth's last war is not centered in the Middle East. It's centered in the minds of God's people. It's a battle between two opposing forces, the force of heaven and the force of hell. And the central issue is this, who has our loyalty? Who has our allegiance? Heaven calls for a final generation of believers who are so charmed by Christ's love, so redeemed by Christ's grace, 
so committed to Christ's purposes, so empowered by His Spirit, so obedient to His commands, that nothing, nothing, nothing can shake them. They are sealed. What is the sealing? It is a settling into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so you cannot be moved. Dan Crawford was the successor to David Livingston, great missionary to Africa. One night, he's sleeping in a, in a small hut in Africa. As he's sleeping, he yawns, and as he stretches, he hits the side of a table, gashes his arm, blood is coming out. He thinks it's going to be okay, wipes off the blood, puts a little temporary bandage on, but dis doesn't use his iodine, the disinfectant. Within 48 hours, gangrene sets in. Temperature rises. Dan Crawford, that great missionary, dies. But he had something written in the flyleaf of his Bible. I carry, I have a new Bible I'm preaching with. My old Bible wore out, and the problem is I preach with it still. But there are so many pages that are worn out, I have to memorize the text because they're not there. But here at this camp, I'm breaking in a new Bible. So here, Dan Crawford wrote this in the flyleaf of his Bible. I wrote it in the flyleaf of my Bible. I read it often. I cannot do it alone. The waves dash fast and high. The fog and the mist set in. The light goes out in the sky. But I know in the end, we too shall win, Jesus and I. A coward wayward and weak. I change with the changing sky. Today I'm so strong and brave, but tomorrow I'm too weak to try. But he never gives up. And in the end, in the end, we too shall win. Jesus and I. We serve a risen Savior. In Christ, by Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, you can make it through the last days. He has never lost a battle yet. Don't you love that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? You know, the background of that hymn is just an amazing story. The hymn was written by a young man by the name of Edward Scriven. Mr. Scriven was a young man in his 20s in the British Isles. He was engaged to be married. They had the church all reserved, planned the reception, sent out the invitations, the night before his wedding, his fiancée went swimming and drowned. Just a, a terrible situation. He was so devastated, he left the British Isles and went up to Canada. Said he could never marry again, never love again. For ten years, he worked out in the woods, chopping wood. Always a Christian, though, never gave up his faith. Met a woman when he was in his thirties. She became the love of his life. They set the date for marriage, and she developed a strange lung disease and died. The only woman in his life that he loved, yet still, was his mother. She was living there in England. He got a telegram that she was dying, and he sat down with tears coming down his face, began to write. Mother, mother, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. The song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, was sent to an aged mother from a young son who had gone through trials, but who had found Jesus precious. Let's stand and sing that song. And this evening, this evening, I have a special appeal. 
There is somebody who came in here tonight carrying a heavy burden. I'm going to invite you to come forward and pray with me. I'm going to come down tonight. This is not a general appeal. But if you came tonight carrying a burden, I don't know what that burden is, but there's been a heavy burden upon you. Why leave this place carrying that burden? Jesus is our mighty Lord. He says, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And I have an appeal tonight for three groups of people. Listen carefully. If God speaks to your heart, come and we're going to pray. Forget about this audience. And those of you who are standing tonight, as people are coming, just lift up your hearts to God. May the Spirit of God come down just now and touch hearts. If you have a burden tonight, class number one, just come as we sing. Let's pray. Let's lay that burden down. Forget about the audience. Just, just talk to Jesus as you come, and at the end, we'll all have a general prayer. Secondly, if in your heart you know you've been drifting from Jesus, and you want to commit to Jesus, you say, Jesus, maybe nobody knows it, but I've been drifting. I'm recommitting tonight. Thirdly, if you want me to pray for you tonight, that, that you or to be baptized. If you want to make a decision, you know what, I've made my decision or I, I want to make a decision in the future to be baptized, I want you to come. So three groups. One, if you have some burden tonight, you come. Lay it down with Jesus. If you want, if you've drifted away and you want to be recommitted, you come. If you want to look forward to baptism, come. I'm going to come down tonight. Let's sing together. Come on up. What a friend. What a friend we have in who? Jesus. You just come. I'm going to come down with you. opportunities for the Spirit of God to come down. If you have some burden in your heart, some burden in your life, why go away with that burden? The Bible says in John 6 verse 37, him that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. We come and make an intelligent choice and say, Lord, I am giving my burden to you. And we believe he's going to take it. We come and make a recommitment to Christ. We come and say, Lord, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Three reasons to come. Those of you who come forward, press in close here so others can come. Let's sing another verse. And if God impresses you, if God touches you, come. God bless you, my brother. i 
knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And even now, if God touches somebody's heart, just slip up. Those of you who are here, I want you to forget about this audience. I just want you to bow your head and make this a special moment between you and Jesus. Tell him about the challenge. Give the burden to him. He's going to take it from you. If you're recommitting your life to Christ, ask him to forgive you and tell him that you want to be his child. If you're looking forward to baptism and you feel weak, he's the author and finisher of your faith. He will do it in your life. Let's pray. Oh, my Father, my Father, you've seen these men and women come to your altar. They have come with hearts longing to know you. Lord, you are the victorious Lord. You are the Savior of mankind. You are a great intercessor in heaven. You are a coming king. You know our needs. We come to you just now. I am thankful that right now you're lifting burdens. Doesn't mean we're not going to have any more trials, but what it does mean is that our hearts are anchored in Christ. That we look beyond the emotions of life and by a conscious act of the will, trust you and we give our lives to you just now. You know the background of each person standing at this altar. You know the people standing in the audience. And Father, there may be somebody in this audience that hasn't come but needs special prayer and they just want to raise their hand right now. If you're in the audience, you haven't come, but you need special prayer, just raise your hand. All hands all through the audience. Father, Father, you see the people that have come. You see the people raising their hands. We believe that you're the infinite God, that you're the omniscient, all-knowing God. You know our hearts. Give us your strength tonight, I pray. And help us have the assurance that through Jesus and by Jesus, we have eternal life in Christ our Lord. Take us through the time ahead, not looking at the trouble, but looking at the one who is the almighty conqueror. Keep us focused on Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.